Some fish in the Amazon are really weird, like the fish with the Latin name Electrophorus electricus, which is called Pes electricus in the Amazon rainforest. The electric eel lives throughout the entire Amazon basin. It's almost impossible to catch sight of one in the powerful flow of the river, and therefore if we want to come across this peculiar creature, we have to go to streams and lagoons during the dry season when the water is shallow and when they stay in muddy pools until the rains return. In actual fact, the electric eel does not belong to the eel family. It's a distant relative of the carp. It is almost blind. It relies on an electric field which it creates with weak discharges with the frequency of one impulse per second for its sense of direction. Its principal weapon is an organ formed by the transformation of its tail muscles. It can generate as many as a hundred electric discharges per second and knock its prey unconscious or kill it outright. This is a nice one. I'd say over five feet and about 12 pounds and 600 volts. I wouldn't like to go for a swim with this. What's interesting is this eel takes 80% of all the oxygen from the water surface. It's unique, beautiful in its own way, but I'm not going to give you a kiss. In the Amazon jungle, we have to rely on ourselves, and so we have to find food in the forest. An Indian delicacy is the Corozo coconut, which grows on the Canambo tree. When you look into it, you see three beautiful worms. But don't worry, they don't taste bad. They taste just the same as a coconut you'd find in the market. The first expedition to the basin of the Queen of Rivers is slowly coming to an end. We've been through a month of intense exploration throughout the area, looking for arapaimas. Although we were unable to catch a truly large arapaima, we know that there is still a chance of finding this fish in nature. There is hope to the last. Like countless times before, we watched the water surface for any sign of the big fish. We have one last afternoon before setting out on the long journey home. We are in one of the largest lagoons discovered during our expedition. At one point, we have the feeling as if the water plants on the opposite bank have moved. In such places, caimans and anacondas hide. The bait flies through the air, and George, our cameraman, captures a moment of absolute authenticity. A huge arapaima. This is incredible. Right after throwing in the bait, we got a bite in about 10 seconds. The bite looked exactly like a piranha. But it's really strong. It isn't a piranha. It's an arapaima and a really big one. Did you see that? Did you see that? It's a huge beast. Oh, grande. Guys, guys, this is incredible. I've done it. It's not over yet, but you've already seen the great fish. A huge arapaima, huge. I'm only afraid it might disappear into the grass. 
Did you see that bite? It was like as if a tiddler took it. And this fish is over seven feet long. Unbelievable. Really unbelievable. This is what I call shaking. This is the biggest freshwater fish I've ever had in my rod. I don't want to push her too hard. My God, did you see that? My heart's beating faster, really. I really think he must have got that jump live. Ouch, a monster! Grande, grandissimo! My friends say 160 pounds. I've got to tell you, I've caught hundreds of catfish over six feet long. But nothing can compare to this. Nothing. Even the dolphins behind me were scared. Guys, I've been fighting it now for at least 40 minutes. And it's still far from running out of strength. I'd say it's more likely that I'm going to give up the ghost first. I'm really doing my best not to push it too much. Because, as you may have noticed, the main line is braid. But at the end, there's a one foot, 60 pound mono line. And I'm a bit worried about that. I don't want to pull it too much. Have you seen the way it flounces its head? I can't imagine what strength it must produce in each such flounce. It's really deep all around us. It isn't possible to land it out here. We've got to go somewhere on the other side. Some beach, maybe. I'm really afraid. We've been pulling it for a long distance. It's a huge fish, really huge. My god, the world record arapaima is around 180 pounds, and all three of us think this fish is close to the limit. So, wish us luck. The guys forgot about the net and the landing net. Or maybe the landing net would be too small for it anyway. But they have a large net that it could be caught to. They forgot it and I don't know what we're going to do. 
Gear is getting close. We're on our way to victory. So I climbed the boat, a large boat, thank goodness. I was afraid Gear wasn't coming. He was away four hours going for water. So really lucky. But now it's going under our boat. It's nothing under the boat, thank God. Really, I don't have much strength left. We've got to be careful. The mono line must be a bit frayed by now. In the final stage, we've got to be extremely careful. We've got it in the net. An hour and a half fight, but in the end we succeeded. Marcelino, grande amigo! Don't be surprised that the light has changed. That was probably the longest fight of my life. We must weigh the fish before we let it go, because we're still hoping the fish could come close to the new world record. Now keep your fingers crossed for us. Finally we learn how much this baby weighs. It's around five pounds below the weight. Good fish, thanks for a wonderful fight. And goodbye. Look at that wide body. Yes, mission accomplished. Now we can go home. The Amazon is a region that, without exaggeration, changed my life a lot and taught me to look at nature more carefully. Now, whenever I fight a beautiful perch at a Czech reservoir, I can only think of the Amazon with love. Five years have passed since our first expedition and a couple of trips back to the Amazon have given me a lot of interesting discoveries, 
experiences and ultimately trophies as well. We caught an even bigger arapaima. The heaviest one was 286 pounds, the biggest arapaima that has ever been caught. A nice perch, don't you think? I've always dreamt of going to the Amazon again, going deeper and meeting people that we can only read about in adventure novels now, the Amazonian Indians. Come with me to the Amazon again, to the South American continent, to try to find those people. We find ourselves on territory belonging to Brazil. Travel is very difficult. We've flown from Europe and now had three flights over the forest. We climb into the final plane through a window because believe it or not, the plane is so small, it doesn't even have a door. We land on a strip cut out of the jungle and have been journeying for five long days. Our destination, little more than mere coordinates, obtained from our old friend, Fernando Gomez. We are heading for the most remote parts of Brazil, where the last Indian tribes live. Some have been in contact with outside visitors before, some have not. They live on territory which is very rich in oil, natural gas and exotic wood. Thus, they represent a final obstacle for some companies searching for easy profits. Therefore, oil and other corporations sent hired so-called civilized Indians there who, equipped with modern weapons, continuously kill whole families of migrating tribes. Many are therefore understandably distrustful and cautious, especially those who have had contact with newcomers. The expedition team now consists of Jacob, our cameraman George, and Jose, our half-Indian friend from Peru. It's not surprising, but the Indians know about us before we know about them. All of a sudden they appear on the riverbank and although they don't look hostile, they are armed with spears and strange long pipes. So naturally we are respectful. We disembark without protest. Their speech sounds unlike any other we've heard before. But none of us feels any danger, and that's important. Jose has been left by the boat, and with basic instruments we join a group of locals who have just gone hunting. We are penetrating into the areas which we've not dreamt of even in our wildest dreams. Time has stopped here. A special bond of trust grows between us and the Indian named Ginto, and we feel as if he's trying to protect us. In the Amazon jungle there are more than 260 Indian dialects, so Spanish or Portuguese are not very useful here. Hands and facial expressions are often all we have to communicate. Although some may still mistakenly think our civilization is somehow further ahead, these men and women possess knowledge and skills long ago lost to us, without which survival in the wilderness would be impossible. These forest people have little knowledge of fishing on the river, but they have excellent knowledge of the forest and life in the jungle. But we must move on. We are exploring the river and hoping to catch sight of the red body of an arapaima before us. The water has a weird yellow color, and Ginto himself does not understand our gestures indicating the search for giant fish on the surface. We adapt to the lifestyle of the Indian tribe. The camera, or the film camera, don't particularly impress these people. At first, they don't understand what we're pointing at them. But when we show them a picture, they really get scared. We assume from their grimaces that they're worried about losing their souls. The only person fearless of our lenses is Ginto. 
He is much respected among the Indians for his courage and bravery. After all, he once saved a small child from the claws of a harpy eagle, whose major diet consists of monkeys weighing up to 20 pounds. As a symbol of his courage, he had the image of the harpy eagle permanently etched onto his chest. On our travels across the forest, the Indians tell us about their experiences related to the river and special fish, which, as they've witnessed, come up to the surface and hum in a strange way. As a result, we set out across the forest to places where this unusual fish has been sighted. The Indians have a weird relationship to the water. They walk naked through the forest, stepping on palm thorns, but when they're about to step over a small puddle, they lose their sense of certainty. After three hours' walk, we reach the place by the river with the indigenous name of Chachawya. The Indians point to the middle of the river, where, as they say, at dusk the bodies of giant fish emerge to the surface under the glowing moon. Determined to verify the tales of the locals, we save the coordinates of the place through satellite navigation. Amazon catfish are predators, and that's why it's necessary to get the right bait. We clear a spot in a banana grove where the roots of the banana tree keep necessary moisture even in the dry season. We're looking for various larvae and earthworms which will ideally serve to catch small bait fish. The river is full of life, but also full of fallen trees and branches, which makes the hunt for bait fish easy. Every unaltered flow cuts the banks, and many waterlogged trees end up on the river bottom. That's the reason we're trying to find a place along the river bank where the current is not as powerful, and there's only low vegetation on the shore. Look at that, what a beauty. This species is called Picolon. It isn't too suitable as bait for large cutfish, but notice its incredibly long whiskers. You should shave, boy. We'll let you go so you can grow a bit. There are about 2,500 discovered and named fish living in the Amazon. But nobody knows exactly how many undiscovered and unnamed fish live here. I don't know what this fish is, even the locals don't. Look at it. It's something between a catfish, a ray and a shark. Its whiskers are this long. A slightly bigger catfish took the bait as well. It's a catfish called Mota. Its barbs aren't poisonous, so we needn't be afraid and can catch it by hand. According to the natives, the Mota is an ideal bait for the large Piraiba. Let's be surprised. The Lechero, the Kuma Kuma, the Brachyplatistema filamentosum in Latin, the catfish which I've told you about. The fish is explosive as a bull, with strength beating the most savage of sea fish of similar size. We have to be ready for the fish not only with the most solid equipment, but we also have to be physically and mentally prepared. Combat with a large catfish of this kind can last several hours, and one small slip of attention can deprive you not only of the catch of a lifetime, one mistake can also lead to serious injury. In these places, the river is virtually interlaced with a network of streams and small rivers, meandering deep into the jungle.
Jose and Jacob set out one last time to explore, hoping to hit upon one of the lagoons photographed in this region by satellites. They're moving along the slightest of rivers, where they are literally beating through the jungle foot by foot. Long hours later, the lagoon emerges, but there's no sign of any arapaimas. It seems that they require a specific biotope, a specific water makeup. That has been our finding over the course of several years on our expeditions. After a strenuous day, we return without any new developments. But we are at least relieved that we've explored another part of the forest. You can never know when and where you might just discover a lagoon of giants. That evening, our reward is the first Amazonian catfish. What's it going to be? Looks like a red-tailed catfish. It's beautiful. Beautiful. The first Amazonian catfish. Beautiful. Now we know what sounds the Indians were trying to describe for us. The catfish family is the most numerous. There are over 2,500 species of catfish living on our blue planet. They are strong, bearded, and have a mouth that devours really everything. Our first night on the Amazon was really generous to us, and we managed to catch this beautiful, colorful red tail catfish one of the most beautiful species in the Amazon. Thanks to its colors, it resembles Amazon parrots. We let it go and continue our trip to the Amazon catfish, which is what this expedition is all about. The red-tailed catfish is an unusually savage and aggressive fish, which can reach the weight of up to almost 100 pounds. Its colors lure aquarists from all over the world, and the fish can be seen in numerous public and private aquariums. To hunt for the catfish, we picked out a place which captivated us at first sight. The river curves here at the right angle and creates a 120-foot pool, yet the average depth in the proximity is merely 30 feet. We are in the place where a large paraiba could be found. A bite on the line by the Amazon catfish is like a runaway train. A few seconds later we manage to slow the catfish down, but it's obvious this won't be a pariba either. Its bite couldn't be mistaken for any other freshwater fish in the world. This is a red-tailed catfish. The multiplicator reaches maximum speed and the fish is able to draw out line for more than half a mile. The red-tailed catfish is a brave warrior but the applied equipment gives the fish hardly any chance. A few minutes later, another beautifully colored catfish appears near the boat.
we're sending the specimen back wishing it had been a large pariba. Once again, we meet our Indian friend Ginto to benefit from his knowledge of the surroundings in search of other corners of the forest. He's come to invite us to a ritual ceremony in his village. We've accepted his invitation, certain that this is going to be an unforgettable experience. On the way, Ginto explains to us that we're going to witness a ritual usually held to bring good fortune to hunting. Only this time, the Indians are doing it not for their sake, but for ours so that we may be successful in fishing. The Indians want to help us, and they believe that fortune will smile on us. A huge catfish, huge, 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 a huge catfish, huge. Presto, presto. Cos'è presto? Così. Aquí, aquí, aquí. No, 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 Jose, para aquí. Aquí, Jose, aquí. I've seen it on the surface. We've got it, we've got it. Oh. 
poquito más. Un poquito más. Right now, I'm the world's happiest man. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Check out this animal. It's an unbelievable monster. This catfish could weigh over 650 pounds and be over 9 feet long. This beauty is close to 9 feet and definitely close to 450 pounds. It's probably the biggest paraiba that has ever been caught. Brachyplatistoma filamentosum, as the catfish is officially called, migrates through the depths of the Amazon River for up to several thousand miles. It's an unbelievable predator, which travels investigating the riverbed with its long whiskers and devouring everything that comes near it. I'll tell you one thing, I definitely wouldn't like to live on the bed of this river. Uno, dos, tres! 